Good morning. Hope you're all doing well today. We, uh, we have been in a series, as Paul mentioned, um, about reclaiming our inner peace. And we've, we, we've talked over the last couple of weeks, and I know Jack did his uh, graduation uh, lesson last week and did a fine job. But we're going to jump back into it this morning. Um, so far, we've talked about failure. We've talked about negativity. We've talked about what to do with, with discouragement. This morning, we're going to talk, talk about a, a subject that I think affects an awful lot of people um, in today's culture especially, and that is the subject of loneliness. Um, loneliness is, is, is something that a lot of people experience but probably don't know they're experiencing. Um, to be alone is, is a legitimate fear that many have, and, and I believe like discouragement, it is a chief tool of Satan himself in keeping the people of God down and isolated and cut off from one another. But that's not how God wants us to live. God knows it is not good for us to be alone. And there's been so much happening in our culture, in our world, that tends to, tends to kind of push us into those directions where we feel more and more isolated, more and more alone. But right from the beginning, in the very very beginning of creation, God declares to us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And, and for too many people, we believe that, oh man, I'm, I'm a loner. I just shouldn't do it on my own. I want to do it by myself. That's not a good way to be. That's not how God intended us to be. So with that, what do we do with it? Well, the, before, we can, before we can identify what to do about it, we first have to understand what it is and what causes it. And, and to answer that question, I'm going to use the Apostle Paul this morning. We've used uh, Peter so far. We've talked about Elijah. We've talked about Nehemiah. It's only right that we include Paul in our study as well. We're going to go back to a time in Paul's life uh, when he was in prison. Uh, he was about to be put to death. It's then that he writes a, a letter, his last letter to his young protege, Timothy, uh, his partner in ministry. He refers to him as his son in the faith, his good friend. And it's obvious through how Paul writes that Paul is lonely. He's experiencing loneliness. And sometimes I know it's difficult for us. We, have, we see these apostles, we see these, these great men of the Bible, and it's hard for us to imagine that they experience the very same things that we experience. But I think it's true. They're human beings just like us. And even the great apostle Paul, I believe, experienced loneliness, especially during this time in his life. And I think it's borne out in how he writes his letter to Timothy. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you want to get over there real quick, we'll be there for a little bit. Because I want to identify three different causes of, of Paul's loneliness. And, and most likely, they're, they're causes that we relate to as well. And the first thing we're going to see, the first cause of loneliness is this idea of transitions. Paul is going to be in the middle of a major transition in his life. And, and I don't have to be the one to stand up here and tell you that life is full of changes. Change happens all the time. And any change in your life has the potential to produce loneliness. Think about it. When you were born, you were lonely until you were placed in the arms of someone you knew. Someone who loved you. That's why, most likely why you cried as soon as you were born and handed off to some stranger. It's like, I don't know you. I can't smell you. I don't feel you. Who are you? And then they give you to mama and everything what? Everything's okay. Everything's okay. How many of you remember your first day of school? Man, that can be a... Yeah, some of us have no clue what that was like. <laughs> I'm sure I, I, I'm just going to relate. Yeah, I think maybe now I have no clue what it was like, but I do know this. It was probably very lonely when you walk into that classroom the first time, especially if you don't know anybody in your class or you don't know anybody in your school and it's the first time you're going and you're looking around and you know nobody. It can be terrifying because you're lonely. You don't know anybody. You can't connect to anybody. How about the first day of a new job? Anybody ever, ever, ever felt loneliness when you walk into a company for the very first time and, and you don't know anybody? You're, you're maybe excited about the new job, but other than the guy maybe who did the interview or the one who, who hired you, but you don't know anybody. You, you military guys, how many of you remember your first day of basic training? 
aside from the sheer terror that you were going through, it was also, you know, there was also a sense of, I'm all by myself in this and, until you made some friends really quickly and found out, you know what, I'm not in this all by myself. Changing jobs, retirement can be lonely. You were once surrounded by people at work and next to you all day long and you interacted with people and you talked with people and then you retire and there's nobody there. It can be lonely. Death, of course, of a spouse, death of a loved one. That transition can cause an immense amount of loneliness because whoever that person was. Now the Apostle Paul was experiencing this transition of his own in his life. And look at verse 9 in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He tells Timothy, do your best to come to me soon. In other words, I need you here. I want you with me. He's, Paul is probably facing one of the greatest challenges of his life. And what did he want? He wants his friends near him. He doesn't want to feel alone. And at all stages of life, loneliness has the potential to creep in. And what do we do about it? Well, here's the thing. Loneliness has, has very little to do with physically being alone. You can be lonely yet surrounded by people. You can be lonely sitting in a church filled with 200 people and feel all alone yourself. I pray that is not the case for you here. But it's possible. You can be. Loneliness doesn't have to do with a lack of people. It has to do with a lack of relationship. Which leads me to the second most likely cause of loneliness in our life, and that's separation. Paul certainly wasn't alone. There were other prisoners there. There were guards, but, but he was lonely and isolated from most of his friends and family. If you think about it for a minute, you know, our, 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 our prison systems, they have a form of punishment within the system itself. If someone does something incredibly bad or, or they want to be punished, what are they, where do they put them? Solitary confinement, it's a punishment. Why? Because even prisoners need to be around other people and they see it as a, as a punishment to be isolated, to be separated. It was certainly true of Paul. Starting in verse 10, he begins listing off people who had been with him but aren't with him anymore. Luke is the only one that is still around and, and he's in a prison in a foreign country and he basically tells Timothy, I miss my people and I want them around me. If you read down through the entire chapter, you hear his loneliness as it comes out. In verse 9 and verse 13, he tells Timothy twice, come to me, please come. And, and in verse 21 of the same chapter, he says, do your best to come before winter. Paul wanted this physical separation from those he was in relationship with to end, to put an end to his loneliness. Physical separation from those we love is painful. We all know this. That's why there are tears at funerals. There's a separation there. Some separation is caused by death. Some is caused by conflict. Some is caused by our own choice. We choose to separate ourselves. Married people can be lonely because there's a disconnect from their spouse. They may be living in the same house, but be separated physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And let me just say this, many want to end their loneliness and repair that relationship. And I'm telling you, it's not too late. You can do that. But that has, that, that has to be done. That has something that you have to do. The third basic cause of loneliness is simple. It's one we all know, and it's simply rejection. Anybody ever experienced it? For those of you that don't have your hand up, I know you're lying. Okay? Or just not being completely forthcoming. That's right. I won't call you a liar. All right, here we go. If you've ever been betrayed or forsaken or abandoned in your time of need by those you thought were closest to you, this is, I think, how Paul was feeling. He was alone. He felt alone. He said, matter of fact, he says it. I was alone standing before Nero in verse 16. He said, at my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. There's a lot of people that can relate to that. A lot of people. Rejection hurts. No matter who you are, and if you've been divorced, if you've been cheated on, if you've been turned down for a job, if you've ever been cut from a team, if you've ever been talked about behind your back, if you've ever been criticized to your face, however you've experienced rejection, and we've all experienced it, you know that consequently loneliness follows. You feel like nobody cares or nobody likes you or nobody wants you around, and that's a very lonely place to be. 
I really, we can, I really believe we can see all of this at work in Paul's life. And, and I give you this example just to say this. First and foremost, you're not alone. Even some of the most greatest men of faith, even in the Bible, suffered and went through the very same thing you're going through. So if you're going through it today, I pray that you're not. But if you are, understand you're in good company. It happens, but there is a cure for it. There is a cure for it. Just because God says, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. I think God has given us through his word, a cure for that loneliness. Because sometimes, you know, here's the thing. We can't do anything about the transitions in our life. Sometimes they just happen. Matter of fact, I, I can't do anything about the fact that I'm getting older. As, as hard as I try, as much as I want to believe, I can still do what I did when I was 25. I can't. And, and reality comes crashing back into me when I try to. And I'm going through a transition in life that says, you know what? You can't lift as much as you used to. You can't work as long as you used to. You can't do what you used to do. And sometimes that can make you feel lonely because you're not who you thought you were. But I can't do anything about that. Sometimes you get transferred. Sometimes you have to move. Sometimes your job ends. Some, those things just happen. Okay? Transitions in your life happen. Separation will happen in your life. Sometimes people you love move. Sometimes people you love die. Sometimes situations happen in your life that are beyond your control. They just happen. Okay? Rejection is going to happen. You're not going to get the job. You're not going to get the loan. Someone's not going to like what you did. Someone's going to talk about you, reject you. It's going to happen. But what is the cure for it? What does God say? You know what? I have a solution for that. And it's simple. It's one word. And it's friends. And it's not the TV show. I'm not advocating that you go home and binge watch friends for the next five years or however long it takes you to go through it. But I am talking about the kind of friend that the Bible talks about. Paul did a great job with his song selection this morning. We'll, and we'll get to that friend, the ultimate friend in Jesus Christ at the end. But still, we need people in our lives. Again, loneliness is not the absence of people. It's the absence of relationship. And today, if you're suffering from loneliness, you need to consider your friends. Kids, if you're taking notes, this one's for you. Okay? Pay attention. That means wake up. No, I'm kidding. Solomon, the Bible tells us, was the wisest man to live on the earth. The wise man also has more to say about friends than any other writer in the Bible. So we're going to shift our attention off of Paul and onto Solomon for some advice. Solomon is going to tell us not only what a good friend looks like, he's also going to tell us how to be a good friend. Because I'll say this more than once during this lesson. If you want good friends, you have to be a good friend. Okay? So it behooves you to do this. And the first thing Solomon's going to tell us and he's going to teach us is simply this. You have to choose your friends. Write that one down. You taking notes? Write that down. Choose your friends. Okay? They don't just happen by mistake. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26. Solomon will say, The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Let me ask you, how many of you truly want to do what God wants you to do? Raise your hand. How many of you truly want to do what God wants you to do? Okay, that puts you in the category, in Solomon's terms here, as the righteous. Those are the people who want to do what God wants wants them to do. And Solomon says that those who want to do what God wants them to do should choose their friends carefully to be cautious about who you call a friend. But, but why? Why should we be careful about the friends we choose? I mean, because let's, let's, social media on Facebook, you know, I, I, the, the record right now is something like 87,000 friends for this one dude. All right. And then, and then, and then Facebook kind of capped it and said, you can't have that many, but while they were still keeping track, this guy had 87,000 friends. I don't know how he dealt with birthdays. I mean, seriously, at a buck a piece, even if you went to the dollar store and got a card for every one of you, you're talking $87,000 a year, just in birthday cards, right? No, those aren't those kind of friends, are they? Everybody's got those friends on there that, oh yeah, friend, 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 friend. No, not really. No, but listen, Solomon says, choose your friends, but choose them carefully. Why? Ever heard this? Evil company corrupts good habits. You choose your friends wrongly and they will corrupt you. 
This goes for kids. This goes for adults. Choose your friends carefully. How about this? A man is known by the company he keeps. Aesop's told us that. Aesop's fables, if you remember him. You say, well, I, I, I'm just hanging out with them. I, I'm just going to be with them. Well, you know what? You're known for the company you keep. Choose your friends carefully. We have to be careful how we choose our friends. And while I'm on the subject, let me just, let me just say this so I can make sure that you've heard it and, and that you can't ever say, well, nobody ever told me this. Well, let me, let me pay attention real quick. Guys, gentlemen, men. You know who I'm talking about now, right? Guys, gentlemen, men, boys. I'll, I'll include them all. Okay. Males. If you need a relationship and you do need relationships and you need somebody to talk to and you need somebody to vent to and you need somebody to text and you need somebody to call, make sure it's another man. Because the quickest path down a road you don't want to be going down is to establish an intimate relationship with a woman who is not your spouse. And I don't care if you're saying, oh, well, she's my friend or she's my confidant. Find somebody else. Trust me. Find somebody else. And ladies, let me tell you the exact same thing. If you need a close relationship with someone other than your spouse that you need to vent to, that you need to talk to, that you need to bear your soul to, make sure it's another woman and not a man. That's the prudent thing to do. It's the wise thing to do. I think it's the godly thing to do. It will not set you up down the road for a problem. Choose your friends wisely. But how? How do I go about doing that? Glad you asked. You ready, guys? You got to write these down. First, here's how you choose your friends. First, you consider eternity. Choose friends who are going where you are going. Okay? You want a close, intimate relationship? Make sure they're on the same path to go where you're going. And your number one destiny in your life, in your position, is to make sure that you are in heaven one day. That is it. And if you're hanging out and choosing friends who don't have that as their goal for where they want to be, find new friends. I'm not telling you not to like people. I'm not telling you not to engage people. But if you need somebody in your life for that type of relationship, they need to be somebody who is going to help you get to heaven. And let me just say this. There is no neutral ground between whether I'm helping you or hurting you in your spirituality. Either you're helping me get to heaven or you're keeping me from getting to heaven. There is no neutral ground in between. You cannot play both sides of the fence. Find friends who will help you get to heaven. Pure and simple. The second, affinity. Choose friends who are doing what you are doing. In other words, make sure they have as a priority in their life the purposes of God. They're not living for the weekend. They're not living to get drunk. They're not living to have sex. They're living for what God wants them to do. Make sure they're doing what you're doing. If you have to change what you're doing and how you would do something in order to be their friend, don't be their friend. Period. Third, chemistry. We hear that all the time, right? Choose friends who are feeling what you are feeling. Oh, we've got great chemistry. No, you probably got a Hallmark card somewhere in the back of your, you know, that's what you look at. We've just got chemistry. Now I probably call that lust. Okay. If I got, if I got real, real down. Chemistry is simply this. Okay. It's a great thing. Chemistry is great, unless it's a class you have to take in high school, then not so much, okay? L let me ask you this. Have you, have, you ever, have you ever met somebody, and man, you just, you just clicked, and, and you got to talking, and, and before long, you realized, hey, they're a believer in Jesus Christ too. And, and, then, and then all of a sudden, you understand, you know what? We've got a lot in common. Why? Because we've got... Chemistry, you've got something in common. You've got the blood of Christ in common. You've got the spirit of God in common. You're both indwelled with the spirit of Christ. That's a commonality. That's the kind of chemistry you need to be looking for. Not how they make you look goo goo, -goo and gaga -ga because of, uh, you know, how their hair's done up. All right? Choose the chemistry that comes from inside their heart. And lastly, the fourth thing, loyalty. Choose friends who will be fighting what you're fighting. In other words, if you have a problem with a certain sin in your life, a certain temptation in your life, you do not want to hang out with friends who will take you to those places to do those things. Okay? You want friends who will keep you from doing the things you don't need to be doing. All right? So choose your friends 
wisely. But the second thing we learn from Solomon is not only should we choose our friends, we also have to love our friends. Proverbs 17, 17, 17, 17 says a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. I love that word adversity. It means trouble. It means hardship. It means difficulty. It means disappointments. It means personal failures. In other words, what Paul or, or what Solomon is telling us, pick friends who will love you even during the very worst times of your life. Pick friends who will love you even when life is hard, when you're facing your greatest challenge, even when you are the hardest to love, they will still love you back. And, and let's be honest, how many of us are sometimes very hard to love? I know I am. I am. I'm difficult sometimes. I know it. I know it. And I'm thankful my best friend, my wife, loves me even when I'm hard to love. But she does. She does. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we use it in funerals all the time. Funerals, we use it in weddings. Same difference, really, when you think about it. <laughs> For those of you who are wondering, I wear the exact same suit to marry you as I do to bury you. So, I mean, there's a lot of commonality going on there, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, though, the great love chapter of the Bible. We always think of it in terms of relationships between husband and wives. But think about it in terms of your relationship with a friend. Think about how you would treat your friends when he says love is patient and kind. Are you patient and kind with your friends? Love does not envy or boast. Are you jealous of your friends? It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Huh? Does this ever play into your friendships? You have to have your way. It's not irritable or resentful. Man, that hits us all sometimes. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Folks, let me ask you, how many of you wish you had friends that loved you like Paul just described here? Wouldn't we all want a friend just like that? I know I would, right? But here's the key. If I want friends to love me like that, guess what? I have to love them like that. It starts with me. It starts with me. Love your friends. Choose your friends wisely. Love your friends. Thirdly, protect your friends. Protect them. Proverbs. Solomon says, oh, hear this. A dishonest man spreads strife. And a whisperer separates close friends. The wisest man in the world recognized that there's people who talk and they get in between relationships and they tear them apart. Solomon's warning us. He says, be on guard against this particular type of person. And this particular type of person is perverse. They are sick. I can't think of a sicker thing in, my mind, in the world than, than somebody who purposefully tries to separate good friends. I just can't imagine that. But, but Solomon sees it. It takes place. And you can't spot them. They're subtle. And their number one goal is to divide friendships. They won't be apparent, but they plant little seeds of doubt between friends, between relationships. And those weeds, those seeds grow into weeds. And you know what a weed will do as it comes up between concrete. It just breaks it apart. And Solomon is warning us, protect your friendship. Protect your relationship because they're valuable. So what kind, of, what kind of seeds do they plant? Well, there's, there's gossip. We all know what it is. It takes place in the parking lot. It takes place in, over coffee. It takes place in, on the phone or through a text or on social media. Watch out for people who spread and plant this type of garbage. And know this, if they will gossip to you about somebody else, they will gossip about you to somebody else. And church, let me tell you this, and I, and I know I've mentioned it before, and I'm going to mention it again. Nothing will destroy the cohesiveness and love and unity of a church quicker than gossip. And we've got to be people who put an end to it. And if it's happening, it has to stop. And if you're, and if you're hearing it, you've got to be one who stops it. But here's the thing. If it's happening about you and your relationships, you really have to stop it. Because Solomon says, we've got to protect our relationships. We've got to protect our friends. Be the kind of friend that protects your friends. We gossip. We make exaggerations. We take a little bit of truth and we expand it into something great. 
We assume motives that aren't there. It's when people think they know why a person did what they did or, or why they are thinking. Do you know why she did that? No. Do you know why she did that? Well, no, I don't know. Do you? Well, I'm not sure. But here's what I think. Conversation should have never gone there. Church, this can't happen between friends. It can't happen within the church. So how do you protect your friends from people like this? After, uh, we go back to Solomon. Proverbs 17, 9. Whoever covers an offense seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates close friends. The first thing we must do is stop the repetition. If you hear it, it stops with you. It doesn't go any further. Things travel pretty fast through the sour grapevine. Everybody, everybody, everybody's got somebody they want to go tell somebody or something. Did you hear about so-and-so? Can you believe so-and-so? Did you see this? Did you hear that? I can't believe she did that. I can't believe he said that. Right? Stop it. If it comes to you, stop it right there. Say, I'm not listening anymore. Put a stop to it. Especially if it's about one of your friends. Especially if it's one of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Stop it dead in its tracks. Are you the kind of friend who stops gossip or are you a conduit for it to continue? Well, I can tell you this. If you're the louder, if you're a conduit for gossip, you are a lousy friend. And if I can say it, you're also a lousy Christian. Don't talk poorly about your friends, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And don't let others talk poorly about them either. Protect them. Protect them. Let love cover their sins. Let me just ask you this. How many of you this morning need grace? So from that, I can ascertain that no one in here is perfect. Therefore, we should extend to others the exact measure of grace we need ourselves. And we all need it. Let love cover sins. Are, are people going to do things that upset us? Absolutely. Are people going to say things that hurt us? Absolutely. Are we going to get offended? Absolutely. Are, are things not going to go our way? Absolutely. Well, what do I do when that happens? Let love cover it. Let love cover it. Let me ask you, how many a times, how many times a day do we offend our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? How many times a day? A lot. Right? We do. And in every situation, we depend upon his grace and mercy to cover us, to forgive us. When your friends disappoint you, and they will. When they say things about you, and they will. When they reject you, and they will. Let love cover it. Extend grace. Protect your friends. Lastly, and maybe the hardest Correct your friends. The most difficult thing to do is to correct a friend. It's much easier and more comfortable to simply ignore the wrong or withdraw from the relationship, neither of which is what a true friend would do. But again, we go to Solomon for advice. In chapter 27, verse 6, he tells us this, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. It's a true friend that says what needs to be said because they love enough that they want what's best for their friends. You have to be willing to speak the truth. Friends, God's cure for loneliness is friends. It's relationships. It's godly relationships. But again, in order to have good friends, you have to be a good friend. So make the choice. Choose them, love them, protect them, correct them. And you'll see your loneliness diminish as your relationships increase. There's one more piece of advice from Solomon I want to pass on to you. We sang about it already. But Solomon in Proverbs 18, 24 says, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, I don't know if 
Solomon had in his mind when he wrote this, but I know the Holy Spirit did when he inspired it. But we know who is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Paul led some amazing songs about it this morning. There's not a friend like who? A lowly Jesus. No, not one. The best you can have. And while we may not have the capacity to always be the kind of friend we've talked about today, we know that Jesus is and Jesus will always be that kind of friend and that kind of brother to us. We know that at times we let our friends down. We're not the kind of friend we need to be. We fail our friends. We disappoint our friends. And many times the, the reasons friendships break apart is because one in the relationship may be asking too much of their friend, more than they can give, more than they have in the tank. But here's the thing. There is that one friend you can never ask too much of, and that one friend is Jesus. You can never ask too much of him. He knows our deepest needs. His resources are unlimited. He always is available. His provision knows no end. We sing the song, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs, what? To bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to him in prayer. Jesus is that friend who sticks closer than a brother. And if you're not in a relationship with Jesus today, I know you're lonely. You may be surrounded by all kinds of people. You may have all kinds of relationships in your life, but you don't have the one friend who will always be by your side no matter what. No matter what transitions come, no matter what separation comes, no matter what rejection comes your way, Jesus will always be there for you. And if you're not in a relationship with him today, I guarantee you, you are lonely. But you don't have to be. Because the very best friend you could have in Jesus invites you into a relationship with him. And he, he, he makes that possible. He made that possible by dying on the cross for your sins to make it possible that he could enter a relationship with you. And today, if you're ready to do that, we're ready to assist you. We're ready to baptize you into his death, burial, and resurrection. Allowing him to cleanse you of your sins and then initiate into a relationship with him based upon his righteousness and his love and his grace and his mercy. And if you're ready to do that, we're going to sing a song. Just come forward or let one of the elders in the back know that you want to do that. We'll make it happen. But maybe today you need the prayers of this congregation to simply say, you know what? I'm lonely and I need more relationship. And maybe, maybe you need prayers to say, you know what? I need to be a better friend I need to be a better friend. Whatever you need, let us know as we stand and as we sing.